Thank you. And thank you for coming to this. Uh, my guest today is uh, Daniel Metley. He's spent um, 25 years, maybe more, in the field of uh, nuclear waste mm -hmm. disposal. Um, he has a technical undergraduate degree. He uh, went to Berkeley and studied uh, political science and public policy. Uh, and then he's um, worked in various ways uh, throughout the nuclear waste disposal issue. He's now a senior staff member at the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. One of the things that struck me um, but throughout this, this afternoon of a, a very interesting conversations is how much uh, this is sort of the um, uh, everything you thought you knew was wrong. <laughs> sort of a afternoon. And, and what I think is really interesting um, about this issue with nuclear waste disposal is that, that most, if you, if you talk to people in, um, in if you, say if you talk to, to senior scientists at Sandia Labs, they get very wound up on the discussion of nuclear waste disposal and they say, if just people would just listen to the science, they get very apoplectic about it. If they would listen to the science, they would know what was right. And, and I think we have put, for 30 years, we've put an emphasis on, on listening to the science. Um, and uh, we spent 10 to $15 billion, and we have y Yucca Mountain. And, um, and I think in, in our conversations, you said the best that can be said about that is that it's in flux. <laughs> so, um, so what I wanted to talk about was, uh, why is Sweden closer to having a disposal system? Let's, get, let's start that off, and then we'll kind of back up to what's going on with the United States. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, before I say anything more, I need to give a bureaucratic disclaimer. Anything that I say has no connection necessarily with my agency, the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. Any opinions I have are my own. Um, but let's get back to your question. Uh, I think you can isolate three very interconnected factors that make a difference in the Swedish case. Okay, I just to back up, Sweden is uh, about one year away from kind of deciding on where they're going to dispose their waste? Um, it's a little bit more. Um, they've begun a process. It's not clear just how many years it will take. And it's certainly not clear what the final outcome of that process is going to be. So the title of this little discussion is perhaps a bit hyperbolic and maybe a little premature. Which will teach you a lesson to <laughs> believe just what you read. <laughs> right. But anyway, yes. <laughs> so back to the story uh, about Sweden. So, so <laughs> I, I would say there are three kind of interconnected <laughs> ingredients that the Swedes have um, dealt with fairly successfully that gives me at least some cause for optimism that they will come up with a solution. And by solution, I mean the licensing and operation of a deep mine geologic repository. So the three factors are political, technical, and social. And I would argue you need all three in order to, to make a difference. So let's start with the political. In Sweden, the powers distributed between the central government and the municipalities in a way that accords the municipalities virtually an unlimited veto over anything taking place within their boundaries having to do with development. And that includes siting a geologic repository. Uh, the veto is not absolute, but for all practical purposes, I think people do believe that if a community objects to the siting of a facility within their borders, they will prevail. Uh, the second thing has to do with technical. Uh, the Swedish repository concept is, has a lot of things going for it. It's essentially disposing of spent nuclear fuel in granite formations. And the things that it's got going for it are, the concept is easy to explain to the public. There are natural analogs that the public can see that gives them confidence that the, uh, that the concept is a viable one. 
And the third factor is um, that if you believe in the law of thermodynamics, the concept is a very powerful one because it rests very firmly on the second law of thermodynamics. So the technical things, I think they've done very well. And then we get to the social. I think there are two aspects of the social situation in Sweden that facilitate the development of a repository. First, there is a high degree of trust among Swedes for their regulatory authority. Second, there is a cultural attitude that's not adversarial. There's a desire to reach consensus. So I would argue that these three elements, the political, the technical, and the social, all combine in Sweden to facilitate the progress that they've made. So tell me just a bit about the process, because my impression is basically, rather than saying, we'll let scientists figure it out, and then we'll go talk to the towns, they basically said, we'll figure out the politics first, and then we'll figure out the science. Yeah, that was a lesson that they came to the hard way. In the early, um, in the late 1980s, the, the implementer, the organization responsible for developing a repository, essentially marched out into the Swedish countryside and said, oh, by the way, we're going to do some, some tests here to see whether your land will work as a repository. And the, the result of that approach was roads being blockaded, uh, considerable antagonism amongst the public. And it, in a sense, it's surprising because everybody understands the political power that municipalities can exercise. Anyway, they sort of retreated from that position and in the early 1990s essentially uh, initiated this voluntary process. And a number of communities indicated some preliminary interest and in the end uh, three communities were seriously interested and the implementer decided that they would do more extensive geological tests at two of the communities. And they were actually in competition with each other. Both communities were strongly interested in hosting a repository. I was sort of using the Tom Sawyer approach about painting the fence, you know, <laughs> get, getting people to compete to do this thing which could be considered awful. Yeah. So, and, and what's interesting here is that it's not just the, the, it's not something innate to Sweden that helped them because political consensus is valued in Japan, but they've had a much harder time reaching the consensus. Yeah. It has something to do with the, the building the political basis first and then going in and doing yeah, I'm not sure we can attribute an order mm -hmm. to this because Switzerland seems to be moving forward very, very well and they started out with a very technical approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese, as you say, had a very similar volunteer approach with, with no success. The British are engaging in a volunteer process so far, they have one area of the country uh, that has expressed some interest, whereas Canada has a voluntary process, and they have 18 communities that are actually interested in potentially hosting a repository. I think it's the combination of the political, the technical, and the social. I don't think you can succeed unless you capture all three of those things. And, and I think the other thing, too, is trust. There has to be a, a level of trust. Can you talk a little bit about, because um, we, we don't have a lot of time mm. left, mm. but can you talk a little bit about how we would reimagine this in the U.S.? If we were, <laughs> let's, say, let's say that we decided we were going to forget about Yucca Mountain, not that we are, but if we did, how, would we go, how could we go forward? We, well, we have to put the waste somewhere. As, as you probably know, President Obama appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission, and they published a report on this subject uh, last Jan in January. And a core part of their argument was that you needed to do a consent-based process, that you really had to start out with the politics. Um, I, I think the experience in this country using 
processes that are not consent-based is pretty dismal. And so I think the BRC's position with respect to a consent-based process is, is probably correct. My feeling, however, was that they failed to give proper recognition that it's this package of political, technical, and social that you've got to work on simultaneously, and that working in one aspect uh, to the detriment, perhaps, of some of the others is, is going to be very difficult. If you, if, if you imagine something going forward, what would it be? How uh, would you build trust? <laughs> How would you build trust? Well, in <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, when I worked for the Department of Energy, I was asked by the secretary to lead a task force looking specifically at this question of public trust and confidence in DOE. And the result of the task force was essentially to say, you can't have a menu of behaviors. Pick one here, you want to pick one here, pick one here, and somehow hope that you'll generate trust. I think the key conclusion of that study was building trust is a recipe. It's like trying to bake a cake without any eggs. It's just not going to work. And you are, you need to recognize that every choice you make as an agency has implications for public trust and confidence in that agency. And it's a tough task, particularly for an agency like DOE, who over the years has, for whatever reason, has uh, built up kind of a legacy of distrust. I think this is a very interesting sort of side point to, to what's going on in the, in the greater discussion in this room about how do you, how does science work with public policy? You know, the trust is, is a key part of it and, um, and the science is actually relatively small and when perhaps, at, well, to end this conversation, one of the things that always makes me laugh is that, that science always ends up generating these blue ribbon panels. And one of the things about blue ribbon panels is that they talk to other people in blue ribbon rooms about blue ribbon subjects and there needs to be sort of a PAPS blue ribbon panel. You know, you need to sort of get out there and mix it up and deal with the things that make people anxious. And, uh, and thank you very much. I appreciate your... It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>